A high savings rate can help you achieve financial independence, retire early, and, well, it's the whole key to getting control over your financial life. You have to save more than you earn. It's as simple as that. And the better you get at this skill, the faster you will build wealth. But how do you save more money? Well, there are the big structural decisions such as where you live, what you drive, your vacation choices. Those are choices that really move the needle, but they are infrequent. What about the smaller choices that you can make on a regular basis? These add up over time so they can move the needle too. And in this video, I wanna share 10 specific tactics to save more. Because the more you have to save, the more you can compound your wealth and achieve financial independence even faster. I've embraced all of these ideas myself so I can vouch for the fact that they are possible. And while no single idea here will make you rich, if you put a bunch of these ideas into practice, you will see results, you will be able to save more money, and you will build wealth faster. All right, the first idea is cook at home. According to the USDA, from 2019 to 2023, food prices rose faster than housing, medical care, and all other major categories aside from transportation. That wouldn't be a big problem if we were spending more because we were buying higher quality, healthier food. Of course, that's not what's happening. For spending on food at home, categories like fats, oils, sugars, sweets, cereals, and bakery products are going up faster than whole foods like fruits, vegetables, meats, and seafood. In addition, the proportion of spending on food away from home is going way up and driving up the overall food costs. According to the USDA, food away from home spending accounted for 56% of total food expenditures in 2022, and that percentage seems to be increasing quickly. Eating out at restaurants, takeout, all that stuff is such an inefficient use of money. You can save so much by cooking at home and turning restaurant meals into rare events. Buy whole foods at the grocery store and learn to prepare them at home. Need help? Well, YouTube is a great resource, but I think it's okay to start simply. Find a way to cook basic meat and vegetable dishes in a pan and put it on a plate. Season it how you like, and you're in business. Once you get in the habit, it gets easier and easier. And instead of thinking of restaurants as a place to go and eat food, think of them as a place to make memories with friends and family instead. There are places to go on special occasions to have a memorable experience. But if you just need food, make it at home. You can easily save hundreds of dollars per month, thousands of dollars per year, just by making this a habit. The next idea is to bring food with you. This can be as simple as brown bagging your lunch for work, but it's much more powerful if you expand this concept and brown bag it everywhere you can. By taking the extra time to pack a lunch or snacks, you'll save yourself the expense of having to stop at a restaurant and grab something when you're out and about. Now, I just got back from Disneyland, which is not a frugal place by any means, but I saved money even in Disneyland by bringing my own snacks and buying food in the park only when it was something truly special, not just because I was hungry. And I make this a habit just about everywhere. I eat substantial, fulfilling meals before I go places, and then I bring my own snacks with me. This way, I don't let myself get too hungry and start making bad decisions. A couple of specific ideas here. You can put that glove compartment to good use by throwing a bunch of beef sticks in there or almond butter and a spoon. You'd be amazed how far a simple jar of almond butter or peanut butter can go. The next idea is to reduce or eliminate your food waste. Now, according to feedingamerica.org, in the United States, people waste 80 million tons of food every year, which equals 149 billion meals. They throw away over $444 billion of food annually. Shockingly, they waste 38% of all the food in America. And so sticking with the food theme here, cutting down on that food waste can help reduce your food budget. If you think of it as not just food that's going in the trash, but actual dollars and cents, the situation seems even more alarming. We're taking our hard-earned money and placing it into a plastic bag and throwing it away every day. Now, the primary way to avoid food waste is to embrace leftovers. Make it a challenge. Make it a game not to throw out food that comes into your home. Prioritize leftovers when looking through your fridge for something to eat. And a couple easy ways to use leftover ingredients are to throw them into a stir fry or into a chopped salad. 
The other way to minimize food waste is to be mindful of the food that's coming into your home to start with. Avoid buying a large quantity of something for just one recipe. Shop your pantry first before making your grocery list and heading out to the store. Just some simple tips, but I think food waste can be a bigger source of wasted money than we all think. The next idea is to make coffee at home. That is, if you're a coffee drinker, if you like tea or something else, you know, I guess the same advice would apply. But I want to talk about coffee specifically because I'm a coffee fiend. Personally, I drink a ton of coffee and the price of coffee at coffee shops keeps going up. I recently paid over $4 for a large drip coffee at a coffee chain store, but I really try to avoid getting ripped off like that by always making my coffee at home. I have a big travel mug that I use and I can fill this sucker up with 20 ounces of steaming hot coffee. And I've learned to drink my coffee black, which keeps it so simple. I just buy a big bag of beans from Costco, grind it there in the store, and that lasts, I I don't even know, maybe two months. Uh, But coffee is a low cost item. How much could this really save over time? Well, let's take a look at some actual numbers and find out. A two and a half bag of coffee beans from Costco lasts a couple months, but let's just say it lasts six weeks, 45 days, because I do drink a lot of coffee. Okay, that bag runs $14 at Costco. That's 31 cents spent per day on coffee with the Costco bag and making the coffee at home. What if we compare this to the alternative of buying one coffee at Starbucks on each of those 45 days? At most Starbucks locations, their big venti coffee is going to run around $3.25, let's say $3.50 with tax. Because unlike our Costco beans, we will pay tax for a cup of Starbucks coffee. So $3.50 per cup, and that's for only one cup. That's not even enough coffee each day for a coffee fiend like me. But let's just take that $3.50 per day times 45 days. That's $157.50, and that's $143.50 in savings every 45 days by making the coffee at home. Over the course of the year, that's $1,164 in savings. The next idea is to keep your thermostat at a reasonable setting. And this starts with wearing clothes. Clothes that are appropriate for the season and the temperature in the house and the temperature outside. If it's cold outside, put on more clothes, put on a sweater, whatever it is, whatever it takes. You don't need to go around wearing t-shirts in your home when it's wintry conditions outside. Or if it's cold, you can use a space heater if you spend a lot of time in certain rooms in your home. And in the summer, open the windows when it's advantageous to do so. It amazes me how neighbors' air conditioners will kick on when the weather outside is cool enough that they could simply open up some windows. I think a lot of people just set their perfect temperature on the thermostat and forget it. My baseline is 70 in the winter, but I'll let it drop down to 66 overnight. Summer is tougher because while you can always put on more clothes or grab a blanket, there's only so much you can do to stay cool in the summer. In the summer, 78 degrees is the baseline that I go with, and I try to remember to turn it off when we're leaving the house. I do recommend to go ahead and learn how to use your programmable thermostat and actually program it and use it in a way that makes sense for your lifestyle. That will save you money without having to remember to adjust the thermostat, turn it off or turn it up and down at different times of the day. According to the U.S. Department of Energy, you can save as much as 10% a year on heating simply by turning your thermostat back 7 to 10 degrees for 8 hours a day from its normal setting. All right, the next idea is to use the library. Now, the library is a great resource for books, of course. You can even check out ebooks and audiobooks. It's especially amazing for kids' books. Kids can crank through a lot of books, and I don't think it makes sense to buy any kids' books except for maybe a handful of those really special ones that you might want to keep forever. Now, in addition to books, audiobooks, and ebooks, your library may give you access to Canopy, which is basically a free streaming service. You just need to log in with your library account, and Canopy has this big catalog of great documentaries, series, award winning movies and a bunch of educational movies, there's enough there on Canopy that you could probably cancel that Netflix or HBO subscription for at least a few months. That's another way to save some money. And libraries also offer other random things like printing services, 
Uh, they may have a library of things where you can check out cameras or certain kinds of equipment, tickets to cultural experiences like museums and stuff like that. And the library in your area may have more or less funding and what they offer is sure to vary, but it's worth investigating. And if you don't have an active library card, an active library account at all, I would encourage you to go ahead and sign up for one. They're free. Plus the library in and of itself is a free activity. Going to the library can be fun and it's a free thing that you can do by yourself or with your family. All right, the next idea is to do low cost investing. It can save you a ton of money kind of behind the scenes by keeping your investing expenses low. There is no reason to pay commissions anymore to buy and sell stocks or ETFs. And the industry is now basically all in on super low cost ETFs, which cover the entire stock market. You can buy these ETFs from pretty much any brokerage for low or no commission. Now, the sneakiest fees with ETFs are the expense ratios. The expense ratio for my favorite ETF, which is VTI, is very low at 0.03%. And it's amazingly easy and inexpensive to buy every publicly traded US stock through an ETF like VTI. And even if you want something more focused on growth stocks, you can get something like SPYG for a 0.04% expense ratio. Or if you're at Fidelity, they have their zero cost index mutual funds uh, like VZROX with a 0.00% expense ratio. Investing fees like expense ratios and commissions tend to kind of run in the background. They're not something we always think about because it just gets pulled from our investments automatically. We don't see that money getting pulled from our accounts or going on our credit card or anything like that. So they're kind of sneaky, but if you can focus on keeping your investing costs low, that's going to save you a ton of money over your investing lifetime. All right, the next idea is to shelter your income to pay less taxes. A lot of income taxes are avoidable, and I think it's important to learn the basics of how income taxes work in America, the tax brackets, the standard deduction, other deduction opportunities, um, especially to learn about tax advantaged accounts. Investments held within retirement accounts such as 401ks or IRAs can grow without being taxed annually on the dividends or interest and capital gains. This means that your earnings can grow and compound over time without being lowered by taxes. And this allows your investments to potentially grow more rapidly. But that's not all. Contributing to tax advantaged accounts can lead to immediate tax benefits as well. For instance, contributions to traditional retirement accounts like traditional IRAs or 401ks are often tax deductible in the year that they're made. This reduces the taxable income for that year. Then there's one of my favorite tax advantaged accounts, the health savings account or HSA. These are triple tax advantaged accounts because contributions are made with pre-tax dollars. The money goes in the account tax-free and comes out tax-free as well when you spend it on certain qualified medical expenses. Now I have a video all about HSAs that you can check out here to learn more. And overall, there's a lot of low-hanging fruit to reduce the amount of income tax you pay by controlling how much of your income is taxable and by understanding and using the tax code to your advantage. The next idea is to make your own cleaning supplies. This is an easy one. Anyone can do this because here's the thing. If you go to the grocery store, there are huge aisles dedicated to cleaning supplies, cleaning products. Most of this stuff is a total ripoff and the chemicals that they use in these products are probably not a great idea to spray all through your home. You can make this stuff at home. All you need are a couple of empty spray bottles and then some ingredients, some basic stuff, some of which you may already have on hand at home like vinegar, castile soap, baking soda, lemon juice, and of course, water. Now, if you want a specific aroma when you clean, you can pick up a bottle of essential oil uh, and add a few drops of the oil to each batch of cleaning solution that you make, and then it will smell all lemony fresh or whatever scent you decide on. It's so easy, so inexpensive to make your own cleaning products, and you will want some basic recipes to get started, I like the all-purpose cleaners listed on the site, The Spruce, which I'll link to below. And my go-to cleaning solution is a simple 50-50 mix of vinegar and water. 
and I add a few drops of essential oil to that to make it smell better than just straight up vinegar. And uh, that's it. I use that on windows and most surfaces around the house. But check out that page on the spruce for more ideas and more specific recipes. The next idea is to use credit cards wisely for travel points. Now, you don't have to go too far down the rabbit hole of this hobby of credit card rewards to save a ton on hotels and flights. You can open up a card here and there and get the bonus and learn how to use the points effectively to get good value out of them. My favorite cards for this are chase cards, which earn ultimate reward points. These points transfer to various airlines and hotel programs. And Hyatt is my favorite program to transfer points to. If you earn ultimate reward points through Chase, they transfer directly to Hyatt, which is great. But if you're playing this game, uh, just make sure you're doing this on spending that you would have done anyway. You don't want to get into a position where you're spending more money just to get points. That doesn't make sense. But I think it's generally a game worth playing. Despite credit card companies' attempts to devalue their points over time, there's still a lot of value to be had out there. I recently traveled with my family to Disneyland, as I mentioned before, and we spent five nights in hotels in California and spent nothing on them, all thanks to Chase Points, which I transferred to Hyatt and booked those free nights. So I'd recommend at least scratching the surface on the credit cards travel rewards game. Open up a couple cards uh, that offer a nice welcome bonus, get that welcome bonus, maybe focus on the chase cards to start out and get a taste of having free hotel nights or free flights. I think of it as a hobby that doesn't take too much time and actually saves me money compared to most hobbies which cost money. And those are 10 ideas to save money on a regular basis and build wealth faster. And check out this video for my sarcastic take on how to ruin your financial life. I think you'll enjoy the tips I have for you there.